Thank you all so much for coming this morning to the Open Source Digital Preservation and Access Stream, um, which was put together uh, by myself, but also a lot of help from other folks, primarily the Open Source Committee and a lot of other people that gave comments and suggestions and stuff. So I'd like to thank the Open Source Committee and everybody that helped put today together, not the least of which, of course, are the people that are doing all of the great programming. We've got a really good lineup of speakers and topics and, and uh, just really stellar. So I'd like to thank everybody for contributing. Um, kicking us off in, with our inaugural session is Trevor Thornton and Lauren Sorensen. Uh, Trevor is an applications developer in the Digital Library Initiative Department at North Carolina State University. Before moving to NC State in, in February, he was at the New York Public Library where he was a senior applications developer with NYPL Labs. Lauren is an audiovisual archivist interested in digital preservation, magnetic media, and open source. Currently at the Library of Congress as part of the American Archive of Public Broadcasting Project, Lauren previously worked at BayVac, or Bay Area Video Coalition, where she helped manage digitization workflows for preservation and access of video and audio for smaller institutions. She participates in the FADG, Born Digital Video and NDSA Standards and Practices Working Groups, and is co-chair of the Independent Media Committee at EMEA, which is when? When is your meeting? Friday at 5.45, all right. Um, and a quick reminder, if you're tweeting, the hashtag for today's stream is hashtag OSDPA. It's on both walls and up here on the podium, in addition to the hashtag AMIA14. Uh, so that would be great if you could tag those with that. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Trevor and Lauren. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, so, uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm an applications developer at NC State. And uh, for developers working in libraries, archives, and museums, um, there's an increasing focus on building tools uh, to solve common problems, um, uh, tools that can be useful to the community at large and not just within the institutions that we work for. And the mechanism that uh, enables us to share these tools is uh, by releasing them as open source projects. Um, Increasingly, the tools that we build are taking the form of web applications. So what I want to do today is give you some background on uh, open source software in general and uh, the technologies behind web applications in particular, um, which I hope will provide some foundation for the rest of the presentations you're going to hear today. Right. Uh, so to start with, uh, let's define what we mean when we talk about open source. First, open source software is made available with a license that permits users to freely run, study, modify, and redistribute the software. There's two notable parts to this. First, uh, the importance of the license, because in its most basic sense, open source is a legal designation, and the license as a legal document is fundamental. Second is the notion of free. When we say that users can freely use the software, uh, we're not talking about cost. We're talking about freedom from legal restrictions. Um, while a lot of open source software is available at no cost, uh, the issue of cost isn't implicit in the designation of open source. Open source software is by definition distributed with its source code <coughs> in a human readable format. Traditionally software can be thought of as taking two forms. Uh, the source code, which is what the developer writes, which is then compiled into uh, machine code, which is what is executed on the computer. In order for developers to study and modify the code, they have to have access to the source code. Um, and the third characteristic of open source is that it's typically, not always, uh, but very often developed collaboratively by developers who are otherwise independent of each other, but come together to solve a common problem. And this is one of the real strengths of the open source model. Um, so to better understand open source, it helps to look at where it came from and how it developed. Uh, in the early days of computing, the focus of the business was on hardware. Uh, and the sharing of software was common, particularly in academic settings. And software was customarily distributed with the source code. Uh, but with the development of mass-produced computers in the 1960s and personal computers in the 70s, a significant industry developed uh, around producing and selling software. And in order to remain competitive, software companies began to implement measures to protect their source code from being copied or modified, which at the time mostly meant just distributing uh, the software as machine-readable binary code and not including the source code. 
At this time, there was no existing legislation prohibiting the sharing of software, but this changed in 1980 when protection under the US copyright law was extended to cover computer software, uh, which gave software the same protections as literary works. Uh, the same period of history saw the rise of what's become known as hacker culture, uh, which is concerned with circumventing the limitations of computer systems in order to extend their functionality. This community increasingly began to see uh, efforts, but these efforts by the software industry to restrict access to source code as an impediment to innovation and to their intellectual freedom. This led to the foundation in 1983 of the GNU Project, which was started by Richard Stallman from M MIT. Uh, with the goal of collabor collaboratively developing software that was free of any restrictions on its use or modification. It's important to note that the copyrighted software doesn't just apply to application software, it also applies to system software, uh, which computers require to do anything at all. And Stallman believed this fundamentally restricted the user's freedom to control their own computers. Uh, so the first thing the GNU project developed was the GNU operating system. Uh, GNU is a recursive acronym that stands for GNU's not Unix, which refers to the fact that GNU is based on the proprietary Unix operating system. But the thing that maybe has had the most uh, lasting impact was the license under which the GNU software was released, which is called the GNU General Public License, or GPL, uh, which provided for the first time a legal basis for giving users the right to copy and distribute the software. In 1985, Stallman founded the Free Software Foundation, a nonprofit corporation dedicated to support the growing free software movement. And in 1986, they published uh, the first formal definition of free software, uh, which is based on four freedoms afforded to users. The freedom to run the program for any purpose, the freedom to study how the program works and change it to suit specific requirements, which is predicated on access to the source code, uh, freedom to redistribute copies, and freedom to distribute copies of modified versions. In 1991, Linus Torvalds developed the first iteration of the Linux kernel, which is another operating system based on Unix, and the next year he released it under the GNU GPL. Linux soon became the first massively collaborative software project, with thousands of developers contributing code over the next few years. In 1997, a programmer named Eric Raymond published an essay called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, in which he analyzed the development of Linux and similar collaborative projects. The title refers to what he saw as two distinct models for developing free software. Uh, the cathedral model refers to a carefully planned and organized process that's closely supervised from start to finish, at the end of which the product is released with its source code. And the bizarre model, which is the situation like Linux, uh, where development happens collaboratively over the internet by individuals with distinct agendas and strengths. Uh, his argument is that this model has inherent efficiencies that come from having lots of people looking at the code and thereby uh, finding and fixing problems more effectively, which he summarizes in the aphorism, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Uh, it's around this time that open source uh, comes uh, into existence as an alternative to free software. Um, there's still controversy about the d distinction between the two, but a good way to think about it is that free software is more concerned with what users can do with the software whereas open source uh, adds on to that this collaborative development model and is really kind of focused on the development model. Um, more often than not nowadays, you might hear people talk about free and open source software, uh, which covers both. But usually when we talk about, uh, when we say open source, we kind of mean all of this stuff together. Um, so in talking about open source as a development model, uh, there are some key principles that characterize it. First is the idea that users are potential co-developers. Uh, it's useful to have users that tell you that your software is broken. Uh, it's more useful to have users that tell you why your software is broken. And because they have access to the source code, they can uh, look at it and tell you what you did wrong. And if given the opportunity, they can fix the problems for you and contribute the code back into the project. Following from this idea is the motto of release early, release often. Uh, when you have this potential for a community of developers to look at your work, it's better to get a minimum viable product out uh, and then when users find bugs or discover potentially useful features that aren't there, you can address these in a timely manner and re-release. Uh, it's often desirable to release multiple versions. Uh, so you'll have one version that's basically stable uh, with the bug fixes and new features tested and vetted. And then you'll have one or more development versions 
which uh, includes new bug fixes, new features that uh, is made available for scrutiny by the community. Open source projects tend to be modular in their design. Uh, this allows developers to work on different parts of the code according to their individual interests or strengths. Uh, it also promotes the reuse of code uh, because it makes it easier to borrow discrete pieces of functionality to use in other places. And in order to keep these projects organized, uh, there needs to be some kind of structure in place uh, to manage what fixes go in and when the releases happen. Uh, this usually falls, or initially will fall to the original developer, but uh, as more people get involved, usually a core group of maintainers will form around the project uh, to kind of steward it into the future. And the thread that runs through all of these things is this idea of community, which is really uh, central to the open source model. Um, community of users and developers working together for mutual benefit. So as I mentioned at the beginning, what makes software open source is that it's released with a license that makes, makes it explicit what the users of the software are allowed to do. Um, just releasing the software on the internet doesn't make it open source because uh, copyright law in the United States and elsewhere applies automatically even if you don't do anything. Uh, it's necessary to have the, the license there to make it explicit that users are free to do whatever they want to with this software. Um, there's a group called the Open Source Initiative, which was founded in 1998 to advocate for open source software development. And one of the big things they do is to evaluate licenses uh, to determine if they can truly be considered open licenses. Um, they publish uh, a document called the Open Source Definition, which is sort of a checklist for things that must be present in the license for it to be considered an open license, which includes the four freedoms that I mentioned before and also things about uh, how the software can be distributed um, or how it can not, not be distributed, sort of. Um, and uh, makes explicit that software needs to be available to anyone for any purpose, regardless of who they are or what their field of endeavor is. There are a lot of uh, open source licenses available. Um, and while they all meet these criteria that I was just talking about, there are some subtle differences between them. Uh, for example, the GPL uh, has uh, uh, requires that derivative works are released under the same license, so under the GPL, uh, which some believe to be too restrictive. The MIT license is uh, probably the most permissive um, and straightforward. Um, the Apache license uh, incorporates elements of patent law into it. Um, so it's good to kind of be aware of what, what the differences are between the licenses. Um, the ones you'll probably see most often are the GPL, the MIT, and the Apache license. Um, and if you're releasing open source software, you can release it under one of these existing licenses. And it's actually better to do that. It's better to use a, a license that people are already familiar with so they know automatically without having to read it uh, what they're allowed to do. So uh, open source software comes in a lot of forms. There's uh, command line utilities, desktop applications, operating systems. Um, but as I mentioned, one of the <laughs> The models that is be in becoming increasingly popular, not just in the open source community, but in general, is the web application model. Uh, you've, you've used web applications before. If you use the web to write email, to edit documents, to watch TV, this is a web application. And the same technology that makes it possible to do these things also makes it possible to do things like manage your collections, uh, which is something that we have traditionally depended on a piece of software to be installed on a specific computer or on a bunch of different computers. Um, the main advantage of uh, the web application is that you install it in one place on a server and any user with a web browser and access to that server automatically has access to the application. Uh, web applications minimize system requirements for users so they don't require a lot of hard drive space or a particularly large amount of RAM. If you can browse the web, you can use the application. Uh, they provide compatibility across platforms and devices. Um, uh, nowadays, most developers will build their applications so they work well on mobile devices just as on uh, laptops and desktops. And web applications provide an increasingly rich user experience as web technologies continue to improve. Excuse me. I'm saying a lot of things. Uh, so, 
web applications can be thought of as uh, having a, a three-tiered structure. There's the, the presentation tier, which is the level at which the user interacts with the application. This, in turn, interacts with the application logic tier, uh, which is the level at which the actual code is running. This is the sort of the, the heart of the application. And then uh, the application logic interacts with the database or storage layer, uh, which is where the data that's accessed or manipulated by the application resides. Looking at this different, a different way, uh, web applications are usually talked about as having a client side and a server side. Uh, the presentation layer lives on the client side in the web browser, uh, which communicates to the server side over HTTP, the standard protocol for data transmission on the web. This, on the server side, there's an HTTP server, which receives a request from the browser, passes it to the application logic, uh, which then interacts with databases, does whatever it needs to do to prepare a response, which it sends back to the HTTP server, which in turn sends it back to the client. Uh, so I want to talk about some of the basic technologies behind all this, starting on the server side. Uh, so in talking about server side technology, this thing called the LAMP stack is uh, as good a place to start as any. Uh, the LAMP stack is a very common set of open source software components uh, used to build and deliver web applications. LAMP is an acronym for the four primary components, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Uh, it's likely that if you have access to a web server, it's running some version of the LAMP stack already. Uh, it's fairly ubiquitous. Um, there are alternatives to each component, both open source and proprietary, uh, but the LAMP stack serves as an archetypal architecture, so in looking at it, we can get a handle on how things work on the server side. So we talked a little bit about Linux already. Uh, Linux is an open source operating system built around the Linux kernel. Uh, it's very common operating system used on web servers, and there are a variety of Linux distributions available that bundle the OS with other uh, utility software. It's not uncommon for this piece of the stack to be uh, substituted with the Microsoft Windows Server, which, as you might have guessed, is not open source. Um, but it can still be used with open source components, and that's kind of the point of open source. You can use it with other software regardless of what it is. Uh, when you substitute uh, Windows, you usually call it WAMP instead of LAMP. That's fun to say. Uh, the next piece is the Apache HTTP server. Uh, I mentioned the HTTP server it accepts HTTP requests, processes them, and sends back an HTTP response. Um, there are other HTTP servers available, but Apache is really the most common uh, by a pretty wide margin. Um, the Apache Software Foundation, which maintains the Apache server, is a community of developers that build and maintain open source software, which is released under the Apache license, which I mentioned. Um, they currently maintain about 150 projects. The HTTP server is really the, the flagship project, and it's the one that is commonly just called Apache. MySQL is an open source Relational database management dan, uh, relation, relational database management system, which I never have to say out loud, um, <laughs> and has traditionally served as the data storage component in the stack. A uh, relational database is one that stores data in a set of inter interrelated tables. Uh, MySQL is very widely used uh, and is the default database uh, for a lot of developers, though a number of open source alternatives have become popular. Uh, Postgres or Postgres SQL, uh, we usually just say Postgres because we're lazy, uh, is an object relational database, which is a hybrid between a relational database and an object-oriented database, which is more than we really need to get into. Uh, but suffice to say that it offers a lot of functionality that isn't available in MySQL, so it's preferred by a lot of developers. There's also a class of databases that are commonly called NoSQL databases, which store their data in some other format other than in tables. Um, this can include uh, storing data as flat documents, uh, which is how CouchDB and MongoDB work. Uh, Redis stores data as discrete key value pairs, lots and lots of little pieces of information. Um, and there are triple stores, which store RDF triples, which are used mostly for linked data applications. Um, it's worth noting that there are some uh, widely used proprietary databases like Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server, which again can be used in conjunction with open source components. PHP 
is a programming language commonly used in writing web applications. And we talk about PHP being part of the LAMP stack. What we're really talking about is the PHP runtime. A runtime system is software that interprets and executes code written in a particular language. Um, and there are, there are other languages that can be used instead of PHP. PHP's been around for a long time and is widely used, but in the last decade or so, you have languages like Python and Ruby and Perl, which has also been around for a while, um, which are viable alternatives and can basically serve the same function. Uh, they have different strengths and weaknesses. The decision on which language to use is highly subjective um, and the source of tedious debate among developers that you should avoid. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, they, they basically do the same thing. This is what you write the code in. This is kind of, this is where, this is what the application kind of is, in a sense. Uh, one last piece of server-side te technology worth mentioning is Apache Solar, which, uh, as you might have guessed, is another Apache software foundation project. Solar is an open source enterprise search engine that provides full text searching, faceting, and a full range of features that uh, you need to search over your data. It's highly scalable means that you can put a lot of data in it and still search over it really quickly. Um, it's actually the most widely used search technology on the web, um, open source or otherwise. Uh, and it's a very common component in open source web applications that requires some kind of search functionality. So moving from the server side now to the client side, uh, the most basic piece of technology there is HTML. If you know anything about web development at all, you've probably heard about HTML. Um, it's the language used to mark up web content and provides the structural foundation for the content. When the browser reads and interprets an HTML document, it generates what's called the document object model or the DOM. Uh, this is a hierarchical representation of everything on the page and is the basis pretty much for everything that happens in the browser. So the DOM is kind of fundamental to everything that is happening on the client side uh, in the application. HTML as you may know, uh, is hypertext markup language. And in the beginning, that's all it did. It was for marking up text and creating hyperlinks. Um, but over the years, developers have always found ways to make HTML do things that it wasn't really designed to do. And the standard has developed in response to these uh, new uses. The current version, HTML5, includes native support for audio and video, local data storage in the browser, 2D drawing, uh, improved interactivity, and a bunch of other things. Uh, mostly in support of HTML's role in web applications. CSS is Cascading Style Sheets, which is a language used to define uh, the visual presentation of web content. Originally, this was a function of HTML, but uh, having the presentation and the structure tied together in one document became uh, increasingly problematic as, as websites became more complicated. So uh, CSS allows us to separate the presentation of the content and the structure of the content into two separate uh, documents. CSS works, uh, for the most part, by assigning display attributes to elements within the DOM. Uh, CSS lets you specify all aspects of layout and display. And the latest version, CSS3, even lets you do basic animation and transformation of elements on the page. JavaScript uh, is, a, is a programming language that is most often used on the client side where it's executed in the browser. Uh, over the last decade or so, JavaScript has become a fundamental component uh, in most web applications, and probably more than any other technology is responsible uh, for web applications becoming a viable alternative to desktop applications. Uh, because it enables developers to provide a comparable user experience to what users are used to uh, in using a traditional desktop app. And there are three things that JavaScript can do to make this possible. First, it can respond to all kinds of user input. Uh, movement of the mouse, mouse clicks, uh, clicking and dragging, scrolling, typing, selecting things in a form, anything that pretty much that you can do with any input device connected to your computer, JavaScript can respond to that and do something. So this is a very powerful feature. Uh, second, it enables manipulation of the DOM. So uh, the user can interact with elements on the page by moving them around, uh, adding new elements, deleting elements, uh, changing the content of the page, um, and manipulating objects on the page in a variety of ways. Third, it provides a mechanism for the browser to interact with the server asynchronously. 
So data can be passed back and forth in the background without interrupting what the user is doing. Uh, if you uh, started typing in a search box and it starts suggesting things that you might be searching, that's the browser sending a message to the server every time you type a letter and the server sending back possible uh, searches. Um, and all this is happening in the background without you even knowing. In addition to these things, JavaScript is also a general purpose programming language. Uh, so it can pretty much do anything that can be done on the server side with PHP, Ruby, or Python. And because of this, you have a growing number of applications that are written entirely in JavaScript running in the browser uh, that only interact with the server occasionally to get new data. Um, this kind of changes the model that the, the diagram of the server side and the client side that I was talking about before. So some of the application logic layer is moving now to the client side. Uh, this trend is has uh, led to the development of Node.js, which is a runtime system for executing JavaScript on the server side. So the code that still needs to run on the server side can also be written in JavaScript. So it's JavaScript all the way down. So when developer sets out to build an application, we don't just sit in front of a blank document and start typing. Um, we start with, uh, usually we start with what's called a, a framework, uh, which is a set of code components that provide a lot of the functionality that's common to most web applications. So rather than spending the time doing the basic stuff that all web apps need to do, um, we can spend time solving the problems that our applications are intended to address. And by building our apps using a framework that a lot of other developers use, it makes it easier for others to look at our code and understand what's going on. Uh, because it's placed within a familiar context. So in building open source web applications, it's uh, that hopefully other developers are going to uh, use and modify and build on top of, uh, it makes a lot of sense to start with a commonly used framework. Uh, so some of the things that frameworks provide are uh, routing and URL mapping, uh, letting the application know which piece of code needs to be uh, used to handle an incoming request page templates for generating uh, documents sent back to the user, interaction with the database, and a model for mapping objects in our code to records in the database, which is called ORM, or object relational mapping, uh, dealing with security issues to keep uh, the evildoers and robots out, out of our systems, uh, and conventions for organizing code, which is more of a design principle than a functionality per se, but which goes back to what I was saying about providing a familiar context uh, so that other developers can understand what's going on. Uh, so uh, some popular frameworks that you'll see, uh, there's Ruby on Rails, which is the one I use pretty much every day, um, which as you may have guessed from the name is written in Ruby. Um, there's Django, which is written in Python. There are numerous frameworks for working with PHP, and there's an increasing number of frameworks for writing applications in JavaScript. These JavaScript frameworks are uh, getting a lot of attention uh, recently and are largely responsible for the growing number of pure JavaScript applications uh, available on the web. Um, so that's you know, some of the, the technologies at work in developing web applications. Um, and it's good to know, if you're not a developer, you if you are a developer, you probably know all that already. If you're not, it's good to just know what these things are so you're familiar with, these, uh, with what's going on with these applications. But uh, what I want to stress, is that you don't have to be a developer to implement open source applications. There are varying levels of involvement, uh, beginning with the most basic, which is just finding a project that solves a problem that you need to solve and trying it out. Uh, you may need help getting it set up. Usually developers will provide some kind of a tutorial on installing and uh, getting things going. Or if you have an IT person that you can work with, work with them. But uh, you know, if, if you're not technically adept as others, don't be afraid. Just jump in and try it, and uh, you'll be better for it. Um, uh, once you get working, you might find things that you need to change to suit your needs. Um, and while this requires a bit more technical expertise, the point is that in working with open source applications, this is something that you can do. You can't do this with Microsoft Excel. If, there's a, if you don't like something that Microsoft Excel does, that's too bad. Uh, but with uh, an open source application, you can change it to do whatever you want with it. Um, uh, and if you think that the modif modifications that you make uh, might be useful to others, you can contribute them back to the original project. 
And if you really want to just build something from scratch, uh, maybe that's a problem that hasn't been solved already, or you think it could be solved a different way, do that and release it uh, so that other people can use it. Release it under an open source license. And finally, I want to come back to this idea of community. Um, so if you have implemented a piece of software, a piece of open source software, you are a part of the user community for that software. Most projects have some mechanism whereby users can communicate with each other and with the developers, either through mailing lists, Google Groups, uh, or on GitHub, which you're going to hear about in a minute. Uh, and, and as a part of the user community, you should feel, if not obliged, at least encouraged to participate and to seek help when you need it and to provide help to other users when you can. Um, I've already talked about the community of developers that forms around the project, the people that write code, contribute code, contribute fixes. Um, uh, but the last community that is really important is the community of supporters. Um, a lot of uh, large open source projects and organizations that support open source development operate on a membership model uh, and smaller projects depend on donations from users to keep going. So sustainability is really an issue in open source projects. So if you or the institution you work for uh, are able to contribute financially to help support these projects, you should really consider doing that. Uh, and that's all I've got. So if uh, you have any questions or you want to get in touch with me, that's my stuff. I'll eventually put my slides there. Um, quick plug for where I work, uh, North Carolina State University Libraries Digital Library Initiative. Uh, some of the projects that uh, we've built, all the projects that we've built, a lot of which uh, are, have been made available open source and are on GitHub. So uh, check them out, try them out, and uh, thanks. I think, that, I think I have a minute for your questions. We'll do questions after. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. Okay. Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, thanks, Chris, for inviting me to do this presentation. Um, so at its most basic, GitHub is a collaborative social media, actually, tool that uh, works with a version control system called Git. Um, according to a recent article, it has 6.8 million users and 15.2 million code repositories, um, more than double the respective numbers recorded two years ago. Um, it's mostly used by coders, but there are several cases where Git has been used in alternate ways, um, like, for example, this, ex this uh, travel log, uh, which I cannot link to from the presenter mode, but um, it's, uh, you know, someone, someone actually made a travel log out of a GitHub repository where they um, had people contribute by pushing and pulling, which is basically the, the idea of giving and checking and um, contributing code. Um, but in this case, it wasn't code. It was travel tips and things like that. So, um, and then there's also another example I have here of a, um, of a GitHub repository that was, uh, that was used for music. So it was a, a notation, um, that, a notation uh, guide that was, that was created and it was contributed from, by people all over the world. So, um, so that's just all to say that um, GitHub and Git are, you know, have many different use cases and, you know, for the archival community, we have, we have different needs. Um, the developer community has different needs. We can all come together um, also for digital preservation and access. So um, that's kind of mostly what I'm going to be talking about today. So what is Git? Um, Git is a version control system uh, developed in 2005 as a part of the Linux system. Um, the original creator with other contribu others contributions is Linus Torvalds, um, he, who also invented the Linux kernel, um, which uh, Trevor mentioned, and is the basis for Ubuntu and other open source operating systems um, for servers and for desktop um, applications. Um, Git is unique in inversion control systems for software in that it works best for distributed or open source models where community and nonlinear decentralized contributions are welcome. Um, there are multiple checks called pushing and pulling, um, and that those who are committers to a particular repository or application um, can gather from other users in the community 
that will wish to contribute. Um, so, and then separate from Git is GitHub, which works with Git, and it's a social way to share versions of things, um, things being historically mostly code and, and associated documentation, um, so that making community contribution is easier. Um, we're going to run through a quick demo of how to use Git with GitHub, and um, I just want to note that I haven't been using it. I, I got a new job in January, I haven't been using it for a while, so I had to relearn this over the course of the last two weeks. So. Please be patient with my <laughs> with my demo, um, but uh, you know I think it's a it's a good uh, lesson to also just work in the command line. Um, and that's what I'm going to be working with today. Um, it's a lot, uh, in my experience, it's a lot more straightforward. GitHub uh, Git GitHub also has a um, a GUI, a graphical user interface, but I find that to be more complex and um, it, it's just a little bit easier to work in command line. I don't don't be afraid of command line. So. Um, I'm going to go into um, my, uh, my demo here, let's see here, Oop. so signing up for GitHub, I'm going to log out here because I have, already have an account, um, but you just go to github.com, you can sign up, pick a username, your email, password, like any many social media sites nowadays. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sign in um, because I already have an account and show you how to create a repository on GitHub. So this is this is separate from what you'll you'll be will be doing next, which is creating a local repository which will live on our computer, like our desktop computer application. So. Um, so right now, what I'm going to be doing, and they'll, they'll, these two, these two, networked and local, will have a relationship, but we'll we'll see that in a moment. Um, so I'm going to go to my user account. This is the page that um, that every user gets, and hopefully the internet will obey. Okay, well, um, <laughs> let's tour the homepage a little bit. So you can you can see that there is a social stream of people that you can follow. See, I follow D. Rice, Dave, <laughs> Hannah Frost. I follow as well. Um, oh, there we go. So it decided to go to my repository or my uh, my account. Um, so here are some contributions that I have made. Um, we had the hack day yesterday, so I contributed to that. Um, I have forked uh, DPDP scripts, which is a project that I used to work on our old job I had. Um, so I forked that over to my account so that I could make changes to it and work on it. Uh, repositories contributed to. These are different repositories that I have um, made some changes to or are a member of. Um, and you can see here contributions um, that I have made in the past based on these colored dots. So what I'm going to do first is create a new repository. And you can name it anything. Um, I'm going to name it AMIA14. And you can put a description. I'm not going to do that. Um, you can make it public. And this is one of the key points of, of GitHub that's really nice is that you can keep it public so that others can use it, fork it, make changes, send their changes to you to approve, things like that. Um, I'm not going to initialize with a readme because um, we'll see soon create the repository, and, and what's really nice about creating it remotely first is that you get these nice, um, these nice instructions for, for um, creating a new repository in the command line. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go back to my terminal and go cd, which is change directory, into AMIA 14. Oh, I did not make that. So I'm going to make a directory, make dir is the command to make a directory, which just makes a folder on whatever um, whatever directory you're currently in. So right now, I am, let's see, yeah, I have to cd into desktop, and I'm going to say make dir amia14. And then um, in order to make my git repository, I'm going to say git init. And that creates an empty git repository. So what that does is it tracks. Um, any files that you put into it. 
it as you command it to do so. Um, so what I'm going to do first is um, create a read a readme file. So I'm going to do touch, which is a command that makes a file. Um, touch readme. Dot md and then you can also do this in text wrangler or to any text editor create a new document save as into that where wherever you're located wherever the dot git folder is located and you won't see any kind of um, result from that but it will be there so you can say okay i am in i am in uh, emia 14 so i'm going to say tree Okay. Well, that did not work. Um, all right, so we're going to go back into uh, this and say git add readme.md. I think I know what happened. I did not add the file to the version control repository, the .git file, so it's not tracking it yet. So we can say git status to look and see what is happening with the file. So we have um, a bunch of untracked files. Oh, I'm still in desktop. That's what happened. All right. Again, thanks for your patience with me. Um, so I'm going to say, all right. Well, I think I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. View. So basically, after you've typed to get in it and made a directory called AMIA14, um, there is a nested folder beneath it called .git, and that file that .git tracks um, all of the all of the hi files that are in that repository. So um, I'm going to go ahead and go back to my demo. And um, create a and config configure the, the file. So I'm going to do I'm going to configure it to be um, into my to have the file communicate with my user in GitHub. So it'll be git config. Global username is Lauren Sorensen. That's my username on GitHub, and I'm going to configure my email as well. All right, so we're going to take some deliberate actions to track the file that we've put into this this um, folder that we're um, that we're now tracking, um, and I'm going to say git add dot which adds everything that's in that folder, which I actually already did, but um, yeah. So this adds it, and we're going to say git status to look and see what we're what we're doing here, and then. Um, Get, and then we're going to commit it to to the um, to the the local the local the local uh, directory. So I'm just going to type in git commit m my first commit. All right. So it added a file. It created a unique identifier for that file. Um, and it is now tracking that file because we've committed it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, remotely add that file over to where I um, created that git repository, which is this instruction right here. And you can also um, see this when you go to um, AMIA 14 in the new newly created repository on github.com. Um, it'll be on the sidebar here. So I'm just going to copy and paste Git remote at origin. And so, um, and then go to git status again just to see what's happening with this. Um, 
nothing to commit but untracked files are present. So I'm going to go ahead and do git add. And it's added the file. We can look at git status. Um, so what we want to do is push the file. So pushing means um, you are pushing the file up to GitHub. So push you origin master. And it'll take a minute because it's communicating with the network now. It's not just local. So, um, so you can see now that it has um, done what, it's, uh, wanted to, what it wanted to do. Um, it pushed it up, up to amia14.git. And you can see here, when we go to the, uh, the repository, that it has, a, they ha it has a file in there. So we went ahead and pushed the file from the local instance which um, can be altered in any way, um, committed to, and then pushed up to a public repository which anyone can go to and fork and uh, alter and do whatever they want with. So it's a nice collaborative way of working and um, a lot of um, open source projects uh, work with Git because it's uh, very amenable to this. All right, I'm going to go back. So how do archivists and cultural heritage workers use Git and GitHub? Um, so there's different uses um, for building software and finding software that's useful for cultural heritage organizations. Um, like I said, I, I haven't worked with Git in a while. That's why I stumbled a little bit. But um, it's a really useful tool for if you um, if you have a certain application that you're looking for, say you know you want to implement checksums in your workflow, you know I would really encourage you to go to GitHub.com and just search for checksums. Um, there's a lot of institutions out there who are working in open source and can actually, um, you know, provide code for you to work with and um, have documentation about what what to use. Um, in the past, I've worked I worked with. Uh, uh, application called Premisers, which we, we kind of made steps um, to, um, to create an XSL document that will um, create premise, premise records um, based on this, the digital repository system that we were working with. Um, QC Tools is a project that, that BayVac is a part of um, that's also open source and, and on the web. Um, the AMS, which is the project that I'm working on right now, the American Archive, has a, um, has a GitHub repository as well. Um, and some of these are not out of the box. You can't just go and um, download them. But if you work with IT, it's a really good opener for working with your IT department and um, creating those connections with developers and with um, people working in IT in your institution. Um, so there's different. There's also different use cases for different institutions. So for distribution, um, my understanding is the library uh, does not use um, GitHub for production purposes um, or project management pur pur purposes, but they use it for distribution only. So they'll make the code um, uh, in another system and then push it to GitHub when they when it's ready for distribution. Um, for project management, um, PB Core is a is a now in active development, and I'm I'm working on that, and we're we're actually tracking, um, tracking changes, requested changes from the community in GitHub via ish, the issues tab. So that can also be used um, for, for projects that don't necessarily have to do with um, you know, web applications or specific, um, specific programs like that, but, but for metadata work too. Um, so for collaborating on coding projects, um, like I said, forking, pushing, and pulling this kind of non-linearity that is um, really essential to Git in GitHub is, um, is something that, that you can really um, work with and um, can be helpful in, 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 you know, if you want to learn to code, you know, you can go onto GitHub and make what you want and, you know, use uh, code that's already been created and improve, improve upon, upon it. Um, to get practical hands-on experience, if you're interested in that, um, there's many YouTube tutorials. There's um, lynda.com. There's uh, schools that you can go to now because developers are so you know prominent in our in our economy right now. Uh, Flatiron, Hackbright, General Assembly. There are many others that are online. Um, and I just wanted to uh, quickly shout out some uh, some tutorials that are out there. 
um, the, some cultural heritage institutions and individuals that are on GitHub. So there you can create an organizational account, you can create an uh, individual account. Um, so we have EMEA Open Source, which is the open source committee here uh, at EMEA that has a pretty active GitHub. Um, WGBH, um, AV Preserve, Dave Rice, um, Ed Su, which is Ed Summers, uh, he uh, now works at Myth. Uh, BAVAC and the Library of Congress um, has a you know the Bagot tool and among others. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to note that um, kind of like most things in our field, um, you know, Steenbeck's film rewinds, uh, professional analog video decks, um, digital preservation and access is often a hybrid of production process use cases and making that work for archives. So you know, tools that might not pertain to exactly what we're doing with archiving, um, we can kind of alter for our own uses. So I think this is another kind of way of, you know, hacking a film, film rewind for archival purposes that used to be used for editing, kind of that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. And if anyone has any questions, um, that's my contact info. Thank you. Um, uh, there's nothing inherent about open source that makes it any more or less secure. It's, uh, it's really the software that's open source. Um, uh, if you remember, I talked about uh, development frameworks, uh, and the, those security features are built into a lot of these frameworks. So uh, if you want to uh, do, if you want to somehow analyze how secure or insecure a project is, um, a good place to start is if it's built in a framework, you can get some uh, uh, advice on how secure the framework is. Um, uh, Rails, which is the one I use a lot, uh, has had sort of a bad reputation for security in the past, but it's improved a lot. Um, so that's the place to start. But the, the point is that it isn't, uh, there isn't, you know, open source versus proprietary. It's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a non-issue. It's uh, it's really what the software actually is. So it's, it's, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Or maybe, fortunately, it's not that simple. Nice. That's a better answer. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So something that can be free and open, but not modifiable by users. Is there a type B of open? Well, that's just free in the sort of uh, generally understood sense of free, as in you don't have to pay for it. Uh, it wouldn't it would not that would the example you're describing would not be open source. It would not be free as in freedom of speech. There are people talk about freedom of speech versus free as in free beer. Um, 
uh, and what you're talking about is free beer. Um, and that, which is, that is a model, I mean, that is a model. You're perfectly, uh, you're, you can do that. Um, but it wouldn't, be a, it wouldn't be considered open source. So there's nothing wrong with giving stuff away for free. I'm all for it. The more, the better, really. There's a, there's a term that Lauren used several times, forking, which is essentially most, the way most uh, Git repositories are set up would be that you would, people could not alter your work. If they wanted to alter it, they would have to duplicate it or fork it to their own repository, and then they could alter it. So, some, so you'd have a main branch and it forks off of that branch. And that's actually, uh, when I talked about the open source definition, that is, uh, that's allowable in, in a license. You can specify that modifications have to be done via patches um, and that the original code has to be uh, maintained. But that doesn't keep people from changing it to do other things. So it depends on kind of how, what, what you actually want to keep people from doing. Um, you, you can always maintain the integrity of the original code. But you can't, if, you know, if it's open source, you can't keep people from doing other stuff with it. Yes, definitely. Um, there's a lot of tutorials out there for um, like command line applications. So command line is basically you're manipulating, um, you know, uh, files and folders in just a different way than you would in like say your Finder in, in Mac. So you know if you look up um, you know Unix command line, um, there a lot of Mac uh, the Mac uh, command line is based in Unix. So you can do a lot of futzing around with that, and it's it's actually really fun. Um, so <laughs> so you can do that, and then also Git. Um, you can you can go to Git dash h. I think it's dash dash h, and that gives you a whole list of the different commands that you can use within Git. So you can just play around with it. So, yeah. Great. I think that's all we have time for. So thank you, Trevor and Lauren.